Okay, so anyway, yeah, this is the firebox portion of the engine. The fire is in there, and the ashes are dropping through the grates into the pan, while at the same time the air is flowing up through the grate and uh, it's giving oxygen to the fire. And just a little add bonus for you right here. This section here, you can't uh, really tell because of the insulation, is uh, actually an extension of the firebox without the fire in it going into the barrel known as combustion chamber and that just adds for uh, extra heating surface for the fire uh, of the water. So really the barrel, the tube portion doesn't start till this uh, section here so the seal starts off again and uh, goes all the way up to the smoke box way up there. So basically in this whole section is just tubes that the gases flow through and the water. And uh, it's heating up in there. And you know that from your science class, you kids out there, you know that 100 degrees Celsius, which is the same in, as 212 degrees Fahrenheit, is the boiling point of water, at which point water turns into steam. But there is, uh, there is an exception to that rule, which is pressure, because uh, the water in here is under pressure meaning that there's no extra air getting inside that uh, that it has to be heated up further thus the fire is pretty hot to get it to turn into steam so most likely the water in here is about 425 degrees usually before it turns into steam and when it turns into steam of course hot things rise so it rises to the highest point in the boiler, which is up there, that dome up there, that's called the steam dome. And uh, basically it flows up and it's captured in there. And then a pipe runs down, called the dry pipe, because you don't want any water in it. And uh, the steam flows down to that, into the throttle valve area. And this whole rod here is the throttle rod, and the throttle levers in the cab. By opening that, you move that rod, and uh, which opens that valve there, uh, which goes inside to an assembly that opens a bunch of pistons to allow the steam to go from the dry pipe into the branch pipes, which are in the smoke box, and down into the steam chest, into the cylinders, where they then push on the pistons to move the rods to turn the reels round and round. From there, the steam goes into the middle of the chest once it exits out the pistons through the valve here and shoots out through the nozzle into the smokestack and then out of the locomotive. This portion is called the smoke box, which I mentioned earlier. It pretty much starts uh, right here in front of the throttle assembly. And uh, that's where all the smoke and gases escape from the tubes after coming from the firebox and helping to heat up the wire as it goes to the boiler. And uh, it just kind of wafts its way out of the uh, smokestack. And usually it's running through those tubes at about, oh, I believe it's between 105 and 110 miles per hour trying to get through the tubes and to the front end. But then it hits that back wall there and it just kind of swirls around and eventually makes it grab a smokestack. However, when the train is moving, the uh, steam from the steam chest exits through the mill and shoots out the stack and mixes with the smoke and, that's, and it shoots the smoke out of the stack too. And this creates a uh, suction of air through the tubes which creates a draft on the fire and it can make it even hotter. Thus, the steam that you're using to make the train go will make the fire hotter, which means you have to add more coal to fuel it and helps you make more steam. So that, so that means the only thing you should have to do aside from add coal would be to add water. Of course, there's, it's actually more to that, but that's the simplest way to put it. So, back in this end here, the front end is the locomotive again. 
You can see up there you got the headlight. And you got the number board 1225. And this one's got number boards on the side of the headlight. And uh, after the CNO took over the Paramark Hat Railroad, they wanted these uh, locomotives to look like their Berkshires and other locomotives as well. So they had what was called flying number boards, which they would be on either side of the bell up top there. We actually ran the 1225 with the flying number boards uh, for about three years. Uh, from 2007 through the 2009 season and uh, we just got restored again and we have not put those back up. Not sure if we're going to or not. Anyway, this is the very front of the engine and uh, this, this front part here where the light is on and the bell and the other lights and the flags here is actually a giant door called the smoke box door and uh, you open up the big one here you see the hinges uh, that open it up and uh, you, op you unscrew all the bolts here on the face and uh, that's how you gain access to the stuff inside the smoke box like the nozzle the, the petticoat which is the bottom of the smoke stack and uh, the seal netting it's no, it's basically a spark arrestor in there that stops sparks from going out the, uh, from shooting out the smokestack and uh, of sorts like that. You know, just basically cinders, large pieces of ash, and uh, that's how you gain access to those to clean them out and stuff. And uh, you use the big door to uh, to do your uh, major reconstruction work on the engine. But for other times, like uh, like just cleaning out the smoke smoke box of ash, you use a small door in here, and uh, all you gotta do is uh, take a wrench and uh, turn uh, the bolts, uh, the nuts on the bolts, about a quarter turn, and then flip those uh, flip those down so you can open the door, and you can vacuum out the ash that's accumulated at the bottom. And so that's basically what happens in the smoke box. It's just a collection of ash and the mixture of steam with the smoke to shoot out the smoke stack. And we'll go up top in a moment to show you how all that other stuff works. Uh, basically because this locomotive is a bit more uh, complex than your conventional steam locomotive. I'll explain that too. Okay, so here we have the smoke stack, and uh, we're parked underneath the smoke jack in the building here. That's what's allowing all the heat and gases to get out here and not uh, asphyxiate us. And uh, a lot of you have asked what this device here is. That's basically a muffler. And what that does is all the uh, appliances on the locomotive run and steam, including the lubrication system, which would be right underneath our feet here in the box. And you can see the red knobs there that control it. So uh, that box is for the valve oil. And uh, that's the oil that runs down into the cylinders. And it took a lot of time there, so it's a little bit thick. And uh, this one, and the engine oil, which is, uh, which is a duplicate of it, on the other side. So that runs all the bearings and not inside the uh, steam chest here which is what this one does, so it's not as thick. Basically the same premise is that it has to be heated up before it goes into the various parts of the mode. So of course you use steam to do that. And so basically what this muffler is, is an exhaust for that steam, and uh, it's basically letting the steam out and it's spitting out all the uh, particles that are in that. And uh, what's left is water that trails down into this pipe here and empties out the bottom of the locomotive. So sometimes you might see drips of water coming out at the bottom of the engine. Basically what that is is a cleaned off uh, exhaust steam that's been condensed and turned back into water. The actual uh, vapor steam is just escaping out the muffler. Anyway. What we have here is this part would normally be covered, but we haven't had time to cover it. But this is the uh, this is the uh, access panel 
for the superhero tube. And uh, for those of you who were listening, I said that this isn't your typical steam locomotive, uh, as you as you might think. You know, it just simply boils wires, creates steam that that runs the engine and goes out the stack. What this is is a superheated steam locomotive. What that means is there's tubes going down from the throttle assembly, which is right here. As you can see, here's the throttle valve. And it's collecting the condensed steam that was not used uh, to go into the pistons. And it's collecting that in the tube and it's sending them back in to the flue tube and reheating it. And it uh, goes back through and gets sent back up to the throttle assembly to be reused. Thus, by reusing the condensed steam and turning it back into superheated steam, you increase the engine's efficiency by about 15 or 20 percent. This had to be on the side of the rope mode. So, coming down this way because it just got a little bit louder. Not having much to do uh, with the actual <coughs> movement of the train is this dome here. This is called the sand dome, or sand box, and uh, this is where you put all your sand on locomotives, and you're thinking, well, what's that mean? Well, uh, basically what happens is, steel wheels on steel rails, uh, you might not think that they, they slip, well, they do, and because uh, there's not enough traction or friction between the rail head and the wheel that's running on it. So it will flip. So what happens is you want to add sand to the track to give it traction because there's, there's friction between the sand grains and the wheel. And that's what helps it to grip the track and get it moving. And this one is a little bit more modern because this one combines air with the sand it used to be in the real olden days, like even the late 1800s, early 1900s. It just had the tube coming off here from the sandbox to release it just right in front of the wheels there. This one actually has a sand squirter, and you just uh, high uh, high pressure air line here flows through, opens the valve, and squirts the sand through the squirter in front of the wheel. This sandbox holds about one ton of sand and you access it through those hatches on the top. Then uh, coming down here, the other portion, this section up here, this little collar thing is uh, kind of obscuring them, but these uh, three things sticking up here are the pop-off valves or safety valves, and each one is set to a different uh, percentage of pressure. Uh, 245, uh, about 275, I think, and then 312, which is the absolute limit of the boiler. Okay, we're above that, and we'd have trouble because when the pressure will push out and it might cause an explosion. So, before that can ever happen, we want these things to start going off. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, that's what these do. Basically, once the pressure reaches high enough, they start going off. And uh, for those of you wondering, I have not found uh, any parts from the 1223, specifically on this locomotive, anywhere on here. However, these pop-off valves, I'm told, are from the 1223. So, those of you wondering, uh, yes, there are parts from the 1223 on here, but none of them too essential as these ones are. I could go around and show you parts from other locomotives around this engine, but uh, I can't find any from the 1223. So, in my opinion, there's no point whatsoever to saying that the 1223 would never run either. Anyway, coming down here. Where uh, this here is another muffler exhaust, 
This one's for the blowdown. Basically, we have water treatment on locomotives. Like I said, this, we dump in from the back of the tender there, right into the water. And, uh, it, uh, it helps to uh, prevent rust and scale buildup inside the boiler. But what happens is that stuff keeps suspended in there and eventually drops in. And, uh, when it drops the bottom of the boiler, you need to get rid of it, so you blow it down, which releases the amount of water in there. And it would either shoot out the side, which it used to do, or it would come up this pipe here and out this muffler system, which spins out the sediment in the top here and lets the steam escape. So that's what blowdown does. It's basically clean out the bottom of the boiler by releasing the steam pressure uh, from the very bottom. Now I should point out that these caps here are the washout plugs. So after the engine's done running, it, uh, and the pressure's gone, and the fire, you know, the fire's been dropped, and the water's been taken out. You climb in there and you hose it all down to get rid of the rust and scale that has built up inside. So that's what these plugs are for. They're highly pressurized, sealed up in there, so it holds the pressure. But then when there's no pressure at all, you just take a wrench and you uh, bang them off there. And they're made of brass, so that way they expand with the locomotive. So that's basically what the washout plug is for. Down here, this is the turret pipe. And basically what that is is a, a steam outlet for all the appliances on the locomotive. And what there is, is in the steam dome itself, aside from the dry pipe down there, is there's openings to a couple other pipes that flow in through the boiler and up to here on these two openings for the turret pipe. While the, uh, the unsaturated steam to get in there, and there's a bunch of valves in there controlled by these levers that go into the manifold inside the cab that you saw in one of the first things. From there, opening those valves allows steam to flow down the several different pipes into the different appliances. This one goes down to the injector, which injects wire into the boiler. Anyway. So that's basically what the turret does. And usually, this one will be covered, but we've ran out of time. And it says there'd also be the, uh, this stuff here, the lagging, which would go over the whole thing. And there'd be some in there inside the, the box that, that contains it. And uh, to keep it all warm. And it'd be, of course, there'd be more jacketing continuing around this. That'd be all painted black, too. So a lot of stuff is missing on here still, but it runs pretty well. Right now you're hearing them shaking the grate, which is allowing more ash to drop down out of the fire and more oxygen to come up. I'm going to come back down to this end now. And here is the pipe, the water pipe, that flows from the injector and into the boiler. So this is how the engineer side gets water in the boiler. Basically, this in here is a valve that, based on the pressure of the water that flows into here, will force that open and force itself into the boiler under pressure. Remember, the boiler can get up to 245 pounds. So, if the boiler was at 245 pounds, well, let's you know, let's say that's normally operating at 220. So it's at 220 pounds in there. And the, the force of the wire going in has to be 221 pounds to get in. So that's how it gets in under pressure. The force of the wire going in has to be more than the, than the force of the pressure inside the boiler itself. I'm going to go on the other side now and get where we missed. Okay, we're on the other side now. This is the fireman's side of the locomotive. Front end again. There's a smoke fat. And now uh, this pipe up here is uh, another steam pipe. This one's for house steam. Uh, back in the 1940s when the locomotive was built, the uh, locomotive would come into the roundhouse, they dropped the fire, but to keep the pressure, they took up, took up the roundhouse boiler using this pipe here. That way it could keep under pressure without uh, wasting more coal. Uh, a bunch of locomotives, the roundhouse just had the one boiler and connect all the steam locomotives in there too 
uh, the house boiling. So that's what this pipe is for here. But we don't have house steam in here. Uh, we don't have that much money to have an auxiliary boiler. Although we could hook it up to the tank engine if that was under steam and uh, theoretically run that. But uh, for right now, uh, this one's actually used to run guest whistles. Like we run uh, the 611's whistle on here. I believe we run the 1218's whistle. Uh, we run some Southern Railway whistles. Uh, a Reading uh, six chime. And lately, Jason has, uh, uh, thanks to the whistle shop, uh, his business, uh, blew one of his whistles on here just last week. So that's what that's used for. So here's the uh, regular whistle that comes with locomotive. It's a Nathan Six Chime. Here's the shot off valve for that. And uh, this one, as well as the cord, which uh, was not original, uh, that was put on later thanks to a different valve that's on here. Uh, but originally, it ran off there. Well, the whistle is blown using uh, steam coming from the steam dome itself here. Uh, but the valve to open it is run by air, which goes into the cab. And if I get to explain the engineer's controls, I will show that to you. So yeah, the air, by opening the valve in the cab, allows the air to flow in here, which opens the valve to blow the steam out the whistle. So that's how that works. So either that or you can use the cord. This cord here is the bell cord and uh, that goes all the way down to the front end. And uh, our bell is also run by air. Uh, the cord isn't even really hooked up right now because I think we've made it too short. It got cut accidentally. But it still runs on air. And I'll, I'll show you the bell. And you can see on the other side the valve that allows it to go back and forth. And this one actually allows it to go up and over. You can actually bring it a whole bunch of times up and over. And have it go like that full black. So you can see the air valve on the other side there. See the bell cord will be hooked up to that there. Anyway, this here is the valve that opens that allows more water into the boiler. This one's coming from the cold water pump that's underneath the fireman's side of the locomotive down there. You can see it there right behind the back driver. Basically what happens is the steam is coming down from the turret and uh, it runs a, uh, it runs like a, you know, just like a regular pump does. It, it runs the wire through and forces it up to the boiler. But it's cold wire, and you can't inject cold wire into the boiler. So what happens is that wire goes to the pipe, and it goes to a box on the front end, which is that box in front of the smoke deck, called the feed wire heater. And so if you wanted to know, that's what that box is. It's basically just a heater that runs off the saw. See, what happens is the smoke and the gas is inside the smoke box, are being are warming up in that there's a big pipe inside the box that the water flows through and it, there's a shower head that comes down inside I believe it's I guess you could say it's like a shower head but it rains down there fills it up and then forces it through the pipe and into the uh, into the boiler here at this valve so without that here there the water will be injected cold Thanks to a pump. So usually when you're just staying still like this, not as much gas is being up because of the steam. So you don't want to run the cold water pump when it's sitting there. So that's when you want the injector. Anyway, coming down here, most of the stuff on here is almost the same. Except for a couple things here. This is a low water alarm pipe. There's, a, there's an alarm whistle inside the cab where if the wire gets too low, like where it's almost exposing the crown sheet, the whistle will go off, that way you'll melt the crown sheet and cause an explosion. This is just, uh, this is just out here to allow the brass to come out, and uh, you can control it, and you can set off the whistle prematurely if you want to do a drill. This, there's actually a cover that goes over and protects this valve, but we found that they had a problem recently, and we had to fix it.
So, uh, so we couldn't do that unless we took the cover off. So hopefully, uh, it keeps running, uh, without it off, basically as is. But we should be fine. This is really hot, and, uh, we didn't have any problem once we took it off. So, we're doing fine now. We're just, uh, hoping to get the valve fixed this winter so that's not going off prematurely. So if you're wondering where some of these pieces are, you know, there's either we gotta fix them or we got other things to add. And it's basically for safety reasons that we do that. So just because we're in a hurry and trying to make it run good, uh, we're trying to get things all uh, fixed up so that way it can happen. So we'll have all winter to make it look pretty. Anyway, so uh, I mentioned the, the blowdown muffler up here. These things here are a couple of dynamos, basically two small generators, and uh, the, the steam flows into them and runs around and uh, turns on a magnet that creates electricity that runs electricity for the cab lights and electronic appliances, including the headlight. And uh, the exhaust blows out there on those exhaust tubes there. So. This is another thing that off the turret, and uh, that's what you hear the little whining, the whining noise uh, when it's going down the track slow enough that you can hear it over the chucking, or when it stops. It's the dynamo. So a lot of locomotives, smaller locomotives have just one dynamo. Uh, some of the other ones, especially passionate locomotives, will have three dynamos to uh, run all their appliances. And sometimes pasture cars, although it depends on if the pasture cars went off steam or not. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go back down to the bottom and uh, show you the injector as well as the close up of the cold water pump. So here's the cold water pump. It's on the fireman's side of the cab. And here's the line coming through from the tender. And, uh, Basically, the steam flows down and pulls the water from the tender valve and uh, forces up these pipes, this one and this one, either side, and up to the feed wire here, up here. So you can see, you can kind of see the pipe in here, but it's really dark. So. We painted it dark uh, black, so that way you couldn't see it uh, when you weren't looking too closely. But it's in there. That flows up. You can see that sheet now right there in the front is, is what's uh, keeping you from seeing it. But the pipe actually goes up there uh, into the heater. And uh, based on how much exhaust you got, is how hot the water gets. And it showers down into the pipe and goes through that pipe into the boiler. Here's George here. We're still on the night watch. Then over here, the thing you see uh, steam coming around from is the injector. Basically, this series of pipes right here. This one's called an inspirator. So uh, I'm gonna get some flag, some flags from uh, people from calling an injector. Basically what it is, is you open up a valve from the tender and here's a hose just like the one on the other side coming from the tender and it runs into the injector and there's uh, steam comes directly from the boiler and mixes directly with the wire so you don't need to, to heat it through a speed wire here, it just goes directly up the pipe and it's forced into the boiler like you saw up top there. And then this drain here, this uh, tailpipe looking thing, is the overflow for that. So basically what you have to do is you have to open the overflow first, and then you open up the steam line, and as that's filling up, you close the overflow. So that way the, it has a way to get into the boiler. And once you shut that off, whatever's left will flow out the overflow. So that way nothing comes back out. There's also a, a dummy way to get that up there. Say if you're just filling the boiler, 
You can get to back the hose to that. See, I'm shaking the grates right now. Letting some of the ash down into the pan. Here's that blowdown that I was talking about earlier. Okay, so you're seeing how the fire works and how steam is created in the boiler and how water gets into the boiler. So basically, uh, now you, know, you need to know how it makes go. Know that drive, the steam drives the rod. But this uh, portion here is called the steam chest and there's an exact identical one like on the other side. And the rods are a bit different. They're about three fifths of way different on the other side. And that's how it allows it to one side to go back in as the other one's going out. That's, base, that's basically how it is. It's, uh, like I said, it's a, there's a lot more to it, but uh, the simplest way to explain it to you is like that. Steam comes down through here and uh, fills up the valve uh, to your portion of it. And based on where that is, let's say the pistons are all the way in on here. And the steam would flow through here even out and come down here and push this way. And once it's all the way out, the steam then flows up in, back into the valve area and pulls the valve gear in. Oh, excuse me, it pushes it out. It pushes it out and runs it around this way. Through the, through the Baker valve gear here, which is basically part of the reverser system, which allows the train to either go in forward or reverse or neutral, which is anywhere in the middle. And, uh, spins the rod around the eccentric crank here while the rods are going around and helps it to go back in. But the main thing is, uh, it's hard to explain with Baker valve gear because really it's just uh, how far the rods have to travel whether it goes in forward or reverse. If this was like a wall shirt valve gear look mode, which is just, which is really like gears because the, the rod has to drop up and down to a different position to where it's in high or low gear. And based on how high or low the gear is, it'll be how it's in forward or reverse. But this is Baker valve gear, so it's different like that. It's based on how far yeah. the rods have to travel. So whether these rods spin that way or that way. And that's the same on the other side. Except three quarters of a turn, uh, two, three fifths of a turn different. And by changing that, by the way, this thing up here, this cage looking thing, is the reverser. You spin a wheel on the cab, and the air pressure turns, pushes the piston out, or in. And there's a little thing here that allows the same thing to happen on the other side. It turns that, pushes that rod, it pulls that rod up here, to either go forward or backwards. And push it forward, push the engine forward, pulling it back, goes in reverse. And it's in the middle right now, so it's in neutral. It can't go anywhere. And it's just like that on the other side. You see how the rods are, are three-fifths of a turn different, or approximately so. Another thing that you might not notice on steam locomotives, uh, because, you know, they're just kind of out of sight, is the weights on the wheels. It's like, well, what are these for? These are counterweights. And why are they different sizes? Well, it's based on where the rods meet. This is drive, This is a third set of drivers, or the main driver, because this is where all the rods connect into one. See here on the crank pin and all that. All coming together on the single axle here. This is called the main driver. That's why we changed it, because that's where all the force is going. Well, most of the force. But it transfers the force from the rods to this wheel, and there's less force going on to these wheels. So you have to have power weights based on how much pressure is going to the track to do that. So since this one has the most pressure going on to the track, then you have to counterbalance that with more weight. And basically what these things are is just pieces of steel welded over a bunch of lead inside there. That gives it all that weight. And there's a certain uh, mathematical formula 
that there is to figure out how much weight that you need for each driver. And that's basically what keeps it, keeps it going up and down the track evenly instead of the rod lifts it up and bangs it back down onto the track and hurts the track. Either way, steam also wants to a lot of pressure on the track. That's, all, that's one of the reasons why it's much easier to run diesel. So then, uh, the steam, once it's done the pistons and the valves here, it runs out through the mill and then up the nozzle, up the stack. While we're in this area, these, these rods here, next to the piston, are uh, part of the lubrication system, an equalizer rod here. This part here is, uh, is uh, connecting to the rod and the piston here. And this is called the main, uh, the drive, main drive rod. Then we got the, uh, the valve gear rod. And then the main rod, which connects all the wheels together in the back. Hmm. Got a good overview of them. And of course, we got the valve dial up here, which is connected to the reverser here, and the valve here inside the steam tank. All these lines coming down here are part of the lubrication system. These lines come in directly from the engine oil right here in this box. And that's what heats it up, and the valve oil is in the similar box on the other side. And it's given, it feeds the oil based on how, many, how the rods go around and turn the wheels. With this rod here, coming off the knee and the valve here, there's also this rod coming off of that, which is turning that crank up there, which is hand turnable. I'll show you here. You can turn that. But as it goes along the tracks, this, this rod here does that automatically. So if you look closer, it goes up and down the track. That handle is spinning around and it's pumping the oil to all the parts here and to the various areas that move. The valve oil will feed lines into here into the piston area. So you want to keep that. So these the lines on the other side here can come from this thing here. Now we talked about what makes it go. What makes it stop is uh, air brakes. And uh, you see the size of the pads on each wheel. In there. You can see a little better here. Now well, they're down here. These are cast iron brake shoes. Not rubber, cast iron. So they wear out and uh, they make a squeaky sound. Not all train cars or locomotives have cast iron. Uh, there are composite and rubber shoes. But on this locomotive, uh, these are specifically built uh, for the purpose of stopping this locomotive. So they do eventually wear out. They make a funny squeaking sound as they go. Uh, it, they work pretty well. And air, like I mentioned, uh, uh, is pumped using these. These are big air compressors. And the air, basically what happens is uh, steam flows down a uh, piston and pushes it down and suppresses and goes back up and uh, fills up the, the air tank. It goes through the lines there. See, there's one air tank. There's one air tank on this side and there's two on the other side. And those fill the tanks a lot of pressurization of the system. What's great about this locomotive is it has two air compressors, both of them protect down the front by these covers. If you remember in the movie The Polar Express, this is where it's conducting the two kids took, uh, took cover as the train went on the roller coaster railway. Here's the compressor on the other side, and they run on uh, compressor oil, which is filled up with these cups here. And the thing is, since they run on steam, they have to be shut off at the end of the day. So these are shut off right now. There's a shut off valve for them. 
I know someone asked uh, what these do, and that's basically what they are for. They allow steam into the air compressors, and they allow, uh, well that's basically it. There's some drain cocks down in there that once you start them up, you gotta let them drain the water out. It's condensed in size, and once that happens, you close those up, and these will, you can, you can run on one compressor, or you can run on both. It depends on how long the train is you want, and how much air pressure you want. So you have a choice with this locomotive. Inside this box is where we keep the air oil. Uh, this used to be the flagman's box. There used to be flags in there. So when, the, uh, when you had the flag crossing, the, you know, the brakeman would uh, grab his flag out of there and flag the crossing. When it was done, uh, you put it back in there. You can also use the flag for switching. So when you need a couple of items up in the front end or you need to throw a switch or whatever, you have your flags in there for you. Basically how the air system works, going back to that, is that it flows through the train line. You know, an engineer opens the valve, allows the air to flow through from the, from the air tanks or compressors that built up through an air line like this. this is a, and uh, the engine and all the cars will have this, and they're connected by an air hose, similar to this. And uh, basically that's what allows the brakes to come out. And it's holding a balance, too. So if the train lost air pressure, the brakes would come on automatically based on the balance. So whether you whether the brakes are off is dependent on whether or not you have enough air to get you there or not. So if you so if you if the engine opens the valve and forces air through, the brakes come on. If you lose air, the brakes come on. That way you can't have a runaway train unless you fly off the air to a point where it was equalized. This here is just a muffler for the uh, for the blowdown. See, after after the steam comes out, the wire will flow down here, similar to what the muffler did on me for the uh, uh, the exhaust for the lubricant. So that's another similar thing. Anyway, back to the brakes. Yeah, that's how they work, and uh, basically it's the whole thing. It's all based on safety. I should be on to another story about that, but that's it for now. So, uh, yeah, let's go into the cab and show you how that stuff works. Bump it once or twice. One more. One more. That's good. They're gonna fit. Yep. No, keep it like that. Yep. <laughs> so uh, we're stuck here in the ice storm, and I thought I'd take the moment to go through the cab with you. Ron's got to sit in the engineer's seat. And now uh, we still got Jason over here. Man, the stoker. Well, that doesn't work right now. I'm more awake this time, too. <laughs> and he's also got control of the water pump, which is, point out those controls there, Jason. Above you. Hey, Jason, point out the water pump controls. Yeah, uh, three water pump? Yeah. That one. Yep. So, that's that pump down there on the on the back end that I mentioned before. And right over here, he's got that control here that goes across to that. But he's also got main control of the injector down here. And of course, the responsibility of driving the train. And for that, we got the throttle up here. We got the brakes. We got the uh, automatic and the independent. 
you got the whistle, which is that valve down there, or you can use the cord, which also goes across so the fireman can blow it too. And of course, uh, we got the reverser, and uh, let's see, we got the sander, we got the bell, and we got the brake gauges, speedometer. Let's see. Give me another quarter turn on the blower. Oh yeah, and Jason has control of the blower, which uh, allows steam into the uh, smoke box to create a draft on the fire. Oh, and we got the pressure gauge up here, double sided. That way the engineer and the fireman can see it. Quarter? Yeah. It also has the engine number on it, so I guess you can tell which engine you're on. Yeah. 